this is the kind of stuff where people look at it and they say, when is this ever, when, is, when are we ever going to use this? And then you find out the answer. And then you say, oh, never mind, forget it. No, no, actually, this is one of the many, many things in this course that has value in the real world, but you don't always get to explore it in the kind of depth that it deserves. So it really depends on where you go after this class, you know? And honestly, I would even say, I could, I've been kind of thinking about this over the last few days. I would even say that until you start specializing in whatever field you're going into, you, you really don't even truly get a good sense of the scope of all the stuff that we learn and why it's useful, but you could start at least getting your feet wet in, in terms of the applications. You know, so exponential growth and decay is really important concept because it, it exists in the physical world, but also we sort of manufacture it in the sense that you now our financial system depends on exponential growth and decay, right? Um, so between those two ideas, there's a, there's a whole host of different possibilities that you can look into in terms of applications, right? So, the, you know, the, the classic case is uh, you're putting money into an account, and if that, that money earns it or that account earns interest o over a period of time at a certain rate, how much you're going to have at the end of the, that period of time. Very simplistic example, because very rarely do people just put money into an account and then just leave it there. At, like for the hell of it. You know, it's usually, I mean, if you have some kind of savings account, there's an ebb and flow to it. You know, if you're really good about savings, then you're probably constantly depositing into a savings account. Every time you deposit into a savings account, it impacts the principal balance, which therefore impacts the amount of interest that you would earn. Right? But also, I mean, if you're anyone, if you're like me, you save for a purpose. You know, you have long-term savings and you have short-term savings. Now, if you're saving for the short-term, you're saving for the purpose of maybe making a purchase. When you have enough money to make that purchase, you withdraw from the account, thereby reducing the amount of money that you can earn interest on. Okay? So there is an avid flow. And so these, these examples that you'll see here are very, very tip of the iceberg, very simplistic. But it is, it, we got to start somewhere anyway. You know. Uh, you have to go down the road of like business mathematics in order to really see it, financial mathematics to see what's really going on. Professor, so, I have a question for you based on our last class. You said that you were redoing your schedule. Do you teach uh, math 135? I do. Do you really? Are you going to teach it next semester? I don't know yet. Oh. So fri Friday evening is the magic day. That's when we'll okay, be so I can ask you next week, like when you're going to teach it. Yes. Okay, cool. All right. Thank you. No problem. So Anthony is an actuary working for a corporate pension fund. And by the way, this is, this isn't really the, the most well thought out example because, um, I mean, if, if you know anything about like what an actuary does, it's, it's not this. So anyway, um, I just got this from a textbook somewhere, but I've been meaning to change it over, over the, like the last decade. Um, say an accountant. Oh, you know what? Not even an accountant. We'll say a financial advisor. The good thing about a financial advisor title is it's kind of a catch-all title, you know, so financial advisors do a whole lot of different things. But if this advisor is working for a pension fund, then, you know, like a, an annuity mutual fund, that kind of thing, then, then it, it is possible that this individual could be looking to have the, pen, the fund itself grow 
uh, by this amount over a period of time. So the question is saying, what interest rate the nearest hundredth of a percent compounded annually does he need for this investment, right? So compound interest, there's actually a few formulas for it. The one that this problem is calling for is A equals P times one plus R over N to the NT power. All right, so the A, it, the A, the P, the R, the N, the T, they all stand for certain things in real life, but Practically speaking, we all, always refer to it as something else. The, the A actually stands for amortization. The P stands for principle, but that doesn't really tell us what we need. The, um, so we'll say the A represents the final amount. P stands for the initial amount. All right. Okay, you know, the amortized value. The principal balance. I mean, there's in, unless you're in the business, you don't you don't always work with those those particular terms. So you just kind of kind of streamline a little a little bit. R is the rate, interest rate, in decimal. So not in percent form, but in decimal form. N is the number of compounding periods per year. And T is the number of years. All right, so in theory, this is a formula that should have come up in college algebra or any algebra course, but I can't take any chances. So here we are, reteaching it or teaching it for the first time, depending on your perspective. All right, final amount, initial amount, interest rate in decimal form. I guess I could write the word form there. Pardon my crappy handwriting. Um, and is number of compounding periods per year, and T is the number of years. Once you have that formula, it's pretty easy to set up the problem, but then we got to go through the process of solving it. All right. So we want to have 14.6 million grow to 22 million over the course of six years. All right. So they're telling us that the final amount to be 22 million. The initial amount should be 14.6 million. The interest rate is what we're looking for. Number of compounding periods per year is compounded annually. Annually happens once a year. So now that would just be a one. If they said compounded monthly, Monthly happens 12 times a year. So, well, you know, just how many times does that interval happen on an annual basis is really what that's going to And then they said uh, six years. So T is going to be equal to six. So I can build my formula here. 22 million. I'm just going to write 22 because. If I put 22 million on one side and 14.6 million on the other side, first thing I'm gonna do is divide both sides by a million anyway, and it would just simplify. So I'm not even gonna bother with that. One plus the R is unknown, the N is one, N times 
section. All right. So then we want to solve this equation. We can clean it up a little bit first. So 22 is equal to 14.6 times one plus R to the sixth power. Little properties of equality here. I can divide out the 14.6. So that 22 over 14.6. That's a pretty hairy looking decimal. Not much better in fraction form. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna leave it like this and say 22 over 14.6 is equal to uh, one plus R to the sixth power. Now, if I wanna solve for R, I gotta break that R free of that binomial. If that power of six wasn't there, that would get the job done. So what I'm going to do is take the sixth root of both sides of the equation. All right, but I don't want to actually use the root notation because cal the calculator is going to have a hard time with that. What I'm going to do instead is raise both sides to the one sixth power. All right, on the left side, we're going to get a funky decimal, so I'm still going to leave that as is, but on the right hand side, the powers are going to cancel and I'm going to be left with a one plus R. All right, so I have this nasty looking expression here. And that's equal to one plus R. If I take that and subtract from it one, then I'll have the value of R. So one more slight resize. So this is what I got to put in my calculator. This whole funky expression raised to the one sixth. Whole thing minus one. And that gives me the value of R. It's the nearest hundredth of a percent. So that's 0 0.0707 in decimal form, which would correspond to 7.07%, which is a really, really nice interest rate. If you know anything about interest rates, you'd be lucky to get anything north of 1%. So 7.07%. All right, that's a little bit of a, a taste of compound interest, but what I want to do is expand on that to show you how we can incorporate a logarithm because I know you're just dying to do that. But we do, we are learning about logarithms, so it makes sense to do something that would actually involve that. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw a little what if here. I'm gonna say a little add on. So my what if scenario is same financial advisor, 
now that we know the interest rate, how long would it take for the investment to grow to 30 million? So at 7.07%, how long until there is 30 million in the account or in the fund. All right. We're assuming everything else is, is, is the same. The only thing is we're not living with this 22 million anymore. All right, our final amount is now variable. I'm, sure, I'm sorry, the final amount's not variable. The, the final amount is now 30 million. The amount of time is variable. So based off of our formula, we know that we have to end up with 30 million. We're starting off with 14.6, one plus 0 0. 0.0707 over one, because again, it's still compounded annually to the NT power. So one times T, now the T is unknown. So this would be the equation I'd have to solve a lot of similarity, except now I have a variable exponent, right? I can divide out the 14.6, the so it would be 30 over 14.6 would be, this all collapses down, it's kind of nice. This is 1.0707, and this is just a T. So believe it or not, we're actually kind of in the home stretch with this one. It just doesn't seem like it because the, the numbers are ugly. But if I rewrite this as, as we did one of these problems here, 20 and 21, so that we had the base, the power, and the result, it becomes a little bit more obvious. So I have 1.0707 T is equal to 30 over 14.6. I'm just assuming the 30 over 14.6 is going to be a hideous decimal. So I didn't even bother looking, but you know, you never know. So I'll give it a I'll give it a shot. Yeah, hideous decimal. The simplified fraction is not much better, so better off leaving it where it is. All right, but in log form, this would be log base 1.0707 of 30 over 14.6 is equal to T. And you can verify that that's true with that circular pattern that I've been talking about. You start off with the base and you work your way around. Base, power, result, 1.0707 raised to the T should be equal to 30 over 14.6. So we have our log structurally correct. And so now it's just a matter of popping this into a calculator. So function log with a little subscript 1.0707. Oops. Fraction 30 over 14.6. So we're talking about roughly 10.5. So this would be 10.5 years, All right? Now I have a general rule of thumb when it comes to word problems. I don't require anything in the way of an algebraic solution when it comes to word problems. So once you have your equation, you could solve it any way you want. And if that means doing that old trick I've been showing all this time, of putting the left side in as one equation, putting the right side in as another and seeing where they cross, 
that's perfectly fine. I can do that with, you know, I, I cleaned it up a little bit just for the sake of not taking too long with this. I'll just use this piece. So I type it in as Y equals 30 over 14.6. Y equals 1.0707 raised to the T power. So in this case, raised to the X power. See where they cross 10.542. All right, 10.5 if you're rounding from nearest 10. All right. So, you know, it's a little, little funky, a lot funky, I'll give you that. But it is doable. You just gotta, you gotta strategize a little bit. Especially when, when you get into those word problems, because I know people just love word problems. They uh they have a logic to them. If you can understand what the logic is and you know what the, the rationale behind it is, what type of word problem it is, then you're ahead of the game. And you know, in terms of um, you know, how do you go about solving it? I try to leave that as vague as possible because I don't want you to be forced into an algebraic solution because we all know it's hard enough to come up with the, the equation itself as it is. I don't want you to get bogged down too, too much with the actual method of solution, all right? Uh, 25 is actually a much simpler type of problem, right? The, the number of guppies living in, it, it, you could tell it's like a, a fictitious problem based off the scenario there. Uh, number of guppies living in logarithm lake doubles every day. If there are four guppies initially, express the number of guppies as a function of time. The uh, general form of an exponential function There's a few varieties of this, basically the same thing, just different, slightly different notation. We say n equals n sub zero times one plus r to the t power. A contextual exponential function typically follows this model where n represents the final amount and sub zero is the initial essay. See, there's a, a consistency here. It's basically the same idea as a compound interest formula, except it doesn't have any compounding part of it. Right? So there is no n. That, that lowercase n that you have here is a different n. Right? Some people use f of x. You know, it, all, it all depends, but sometimes it's a function of time. Sometimes it's a function of rate. So we don't want to restrict ourselves when it comes to that. But we would say n here is the final amount. n sub zero is equal to the initial amount. R is the rate in decimal form. Per unit of time. And T is units of time. All right, so again, you know, it's, I could say it again, but it's, we're still in that territory of, yep. You've have seen this before too, but you never know. Can't take the chance, so here I am teaching it again. All right. So, go plug some numbers in, see how it goes, get a solution, and then evaluate that solution. Um, in, in terms of uh, new formulas, this is pretty much the extent of it. So, it's one of these two. I mean, there's actually one more, but it's a much simpler one. Um, the number of guppies, again, it doubles every day express the number of guppies a, a, as a function of time t, all right? So there's two ways to handle this. I'm going to show you the, um, I hate to say it this way because it, it doesn't make anybody feel good. I'm going to show you the more complicated way of figuring it out. 
the reason why is the shortcut method, it only works for literally this one type of problem. It's a doubling formula. It doesn't really help if you're dealing with something that shows a rate of increase of like 25%, right? You know, instead of doubling, it quadruples. You know, you'd, you'd need a different formula. So I wanna give you something that's gonna work in all cases, all right? So that's, that's kind of the reality there. So if something is gonna double, doubling means that the final amount is twice the initial amount. Okay, final amount is twice the initial amount. So whatever you put in for n sub zero, you put in double that for n. You can even put a variable in if you want. It doesn't, it doesn't make a difference. Okay. What we need to do is solve for the rate. It says it's doubling every day. Right. So I have my n equals n sub zero, one plus r to the t power. So I'm going to put in some, some dummy value for n sub zero. It doesn't matter what you put in as long as the final amount is twice that, right? So I'm going to say, let's let the initial amount be five, right? I'm just making up a number here. This could be whatever I want, right? If this is five, then this is 10, right? Now, the unit of time says every day. Every day is a singular. That means every one day, right? So that would be an example of double, right? I could also say, Six. I could put a six here. If I put a six there, I'd put a 12 there. All right. If I want to, I could put a 10 here and a 20 there. You'll notice no matter what I put here, this is always twice that. So I could put an A here. This would be 2A. All right. But let me go back to the five and 10. If I put a five on the, on the right and a 10 on the left, the next step in the process would be to divide both sides by five, in which case I'd get a two here and a one here, right? It begs the question, would it be any different if I put a six here and a 12 here, divide by six, divide by six, you get a two, you get a one, right? I know this one says that there are four guppies initially. I'm not really worried about that because I wanna give you a method that works for doubling no matter what the initial value is, all right? So let's say I have an A here and a two A here. My next step would be to divide both sides by A, cancel, 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 cancel. I'd have a two here and a one here. Bottom line is if you're dealing with a doubling situation, I'm erasing all this stuff as we go because I don't want any of that stuff. If you're dealing with doubling, you just need there to be a two to one ratio between your final amount and your initial amount, all right? So this needs to be a two to one ratio, all right? If, if I'm quintupling, it would be a five to one ratio, all right? It really, it really depends on the situation. Now, it, they could actually give you the ratio and say that that's a one and a half to one ratio, you know, like it depends on the problem. You know, the number of guppies uh, living in logarithm lake increases uh, by a rate of, or by a ratio of seven to one on a daily basis, right? So you gotta be ready for something like that. But in doing this, I now have the means by which I can solve for the value of R. So this tells me that two is equal to one plus R, very easy, much easier than what we had to do up here to solve for R. But that gives me an R value of one, right? 
So my R value for a doubling situation is actually just a one, right? So when I set up my formula, I would be saying N is equal to N sub zero, one plus one to the T power, All right? That one plus one gives you a two. And that's what I was talking about in terms of a shortcut. I don't want to just tell you, oh yeah, if you ever see double, just put a two in here in the parentheses, it'll always work. Yeah, it'll always work when you're given a problem where they ask you to double, but they're not always going to ask you to double. I'm not always going to ask you to double. I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not going to always ask you to double, All right? So they're saying express the function, the number of guppies as a function of time t. Well, they told us the initial amount. They told us that there are four guppies initially. So that's my n sub o. So my function would be n of t is equal to four times two to the t power. Right? All that for just part a. But like I said before, that, that was the hard part. Once you get that, parts B and C are done. There's really nothing else to do. It's all calculator work. Because part B says use your answer to part A to find out how, how many guppies will be there after one week. Well, if T is a unit of time and time is measured in days, just asking me to find N of seven. That's one week. So four times two to the seventh power, all right? But I would even go back to this right here and say, oh, let's slow down and not even think about substituting by hand. Let's put this into our calculators and let's see if it'll even accept it using the notation that we decided on. All right, so it accepted our notation. So if I want to find n of seven, all I'd have to do is type in n of seven, and it just spits out the 512, the 512 guppies. A lot of guppies. I, I don't know how prolific the uh, reproduction rate of guppies are. I mean, I, I don't know if that's a lot or a little, but it seems like a lot of guppies. All right. Now, in C, it says use your answer to find to the nearest day when there will be 2,000 guppies. Right. So there's two ways to do that. One way would be using a technique like what we did up here, which would involve a logarithm, which I'll show you in a sec. But before we do that, I'll give you the graph and calculator solution because we took the time to put the equation into our calculator. Why not actually make use of that, All right? So what I would do is graph y equals 2000. And you're like, there's nothing there. Oh, it's 2,000, it's Y value of 2,000. My graph only goes up to 40. So let me hit on that little wrench jammy there and make my Y value, instead of going up to like 40, let's make it go up to like 2,000. Now you can see your line, you tap on that bad boy, the X value is really T in this context. So we have our answer, all right? But let's say you were desperate to do this with logarithms. And honestly, all kidding aside, some of us, you know, we know that we're gonna have to use this in the future and we know we're gonna have to do it by hand. So we, we are kind of desperate to know how to do it with logarithms. We would take our N of T function, And 
we know the final amount is supposed to be 2000. I want to solve this for T. I don't like having that four there in front, so I'm going to knock that off. So 500 is equal to two to the T power. We're going to put this into log form. Remember, it's kind of nicer to have it written with the exponential piece on the left-hand side. This is going to be log base two of 500 is equal to T. Again, just check it with that little circular motion pattern. Two raised to the T power is equal to 500. All right, but now I can pop it into Desmos. A little subscript of two of 500. And we see that we get that same decimal value about 8.966. It says round to the nearest day, T's in days. So T would be approximately nine days. So it'd be nine days before we're overrun with guppies. Terrifying. I don't know. Guppies don't, don't bother me too much, but birds freak me out big time. I don't know. Back in the day, when I would walk through Washington Square Park in the city, there's a, there were all of those pigeons that were in the, the pathways. And I don't know, I guess it got in my head. And that, birds never used to bother me, but they made me look like a schmuck way too often. Because I would walk through those little pathways and the birds or the pigeons, they would they'd be all like milling around like a thousand of them in the pathway. And I go walking through, there's no way around them. You got to walk through them. And so I'd walk through thinking, all right, don't panic. They're not going to attack you. And whenever I would do that, they would fly up in the air, go nuts, and then totally attack me. But then anytime I'd go through the pathways, like covering my face, like, don't attack me, it'll be fine. You know, like, I'm, I'm going to make it through. Then they would just continue to mill around on the ground there. And everybody would look at me and be like, dude, what's your problem? They're, they're just birds. So birds freak me out, which is why You'll never see a word problem involving birds. Birds are related to dinosaurs. They sure are. So are birds That's reptiles? What's that? Are birds reptiles? They are reptilian. They're, so every they're... time you eat bird, it's like eating alligator. Yeah, that's why alligator tastes just like chicken. This is a common discussion in my household. <laughs> Yeah. just to let you know how much of a nerd i am like birds are reptiles have you ever had alligator um there's a place called the bayou in malvernon and i think i've eaten it there yeah it's like a gamey chicken yeah i'm yeah. not really interested in that type of stuff it's kind of gross yeah honestly i didn't know i was eating it when i ate it i was down in new orleans and I was like, oh, this chicken tastes a little funny. And they're like, that's because it's not chicken. <laughs> it's kind of like, like oh. salty or something. I don't know. Hey, it's just, it's, it's just gamey. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like tougher and uh, it's something. But I, I was on a safari once and I ate all sorts of weird stuff that I didn't know I was eating. I didn't like, for example, I didn't know ostrich was red meat. No, so I, thought way. I, was, I thought it was foul. It's an ostrich. It, it's another reptile. Yeah, well, this reptile is like full blown, like T bone steak red meat. Dude, it's a cow. So yeah, basically. So I'm eating this thing and I'm like, man, this steak is tough. They're like, that's because it's ostrich. I'm like, and why, why do I was like, why do people keep doing that to me? Like, every time I comment on something, like, I'm eating impala. I thought it was chicken. Not a, How not do you get yourself in the situation where you have something in front of you that you don't know what it is if you didn't order it? Well, because it's like the chef special. 
oh my god you're asking for it yeah. give you like like uni like stuff that like moves across your like plate yeah well, you know I- I do, I do have a, my little uh, Indiana Jones Temple of Doom fears where it's like they open the, the thing and you, your dinner's looking at you. But but so far, it's been all right. It's just like a little surprising, you know. But definitely, I've learned a few things about culinary uh, things around the world. Right. Oh, so anyway, uh, the next couple of problems already have the uh, the question kind of like framed in terms of uh, an equation. So these are a whole lot more manageable. So I'm gonna put some stars on these. But I wanted to take you through an instance that involved a continuous compound interest case, because that's the last formula that we need to talk about. Because everything else, you could see compounded annually, compounded quarterly, quarterly so it's all coming back to that one formula right that first formula that we talked about and then after that we get into trig which we're based on the clock definitely not getting into tonight but but definitely wanted to take care of this one so how many years to the nearest year will it take the world population to double if it grows continuously at an annual rate of two percent right so Continuous exponential growth could also be decay. If it's anything that's growth can also be decay because if the R value is negative, if the interest rate is being subtracted from the, the whole, then that's showing a decline. But I'll show you what that looks like in a little bit. So the formula here is n is equal to n sub zero e to the kt power or in the context of money a equals p e to the rt power all right The only new variable here is the K, and that K is the uh, the growth constant, right? So rate of growth or decay. All right. So how many years to the nearest year? So they're asking for time. So if I'm working with this formula, we want the population to double. We know doubling is a two to one ratio. So I put a two here, a one here, an E. They gave us the, the interest of interest rate. Doesn't apply when you're talking about people, but I see annual and I think interest, but 0.02 T is what we're looking for. And so once we have our equation, we're actually in pretty good shape because this is, this is actually going to be a whole lot simpler than some of the other problems we've been doing. Because you clean this up, you got E to the point zero to T is equal to two. If I put this into log form, again, log base E of two would be 0.02 T. And again, we just do a quick check, the little circular pattern. E to the 0.02 T is equal to two. So we're in good shape there. Log base E is the same as saying natural log LN.
a term coined by John Napier, a Frenchman, who invented the term natural log, but referred to it as log natural, hence the LN abbreviation for natural log. Speaking of the word of the day, we'll go with interest. Interest, interest is the word of the day. Like interest rate, or I, I have interest in this topic, but interest. Okay. Well, to get a solution here, I'm gonna divide both sides by 0.02t. No, I'm sorry, 0.02, there we go. Well, I'll leave the t there. And so we get T is equal to whatever you get when you take the natural log, log natural, and divide it by 0 0.02. So 34.65, blah, blah, blah. But they said how many years to the nearest year? I'll put the decimal and then I'll, I'll round it. 34. Point, we'll say 657 but approximately 35 years. All right, so if the population were growing at a rate of 2%, it would take 35 years to double. Right. That was a pretty lengthy period of time. Um, I forget where I was reading it, and honestly, it, it's entirely possible that I was that it was completely fictional. I was reading it in a in a novel or something. It might have been from the book Inferno. But I thought I read somewhere that the human population doubles on an annual basis, but that doesn't seem right. Or at least we're within like 30 years of it doubling on an annual basis. No, uh, something, something insane like that, where it's like, inc like inconceivable, not in the Princess Bride sense. So, uh, well, let's take a look at this graph real quick. Actually, let's take a look at two graphs. Let's, let's is an overused word these days. I'm going to take. The ordinary exponential growth function, and that would be n equals or n of t is equal to n sub o. Not superscript, subscript. One plus R raised to the T power. Okay. So that's exponential growth, the ordinary one uh, from the previous page. Let me make a little note of that. And then I'll throw it, actually I'll put the sliders first. And then I'll throw in continuous exponential growth. I'm being a little bit more meticulous about this because I'm gonna save this on Blackboard for you. Okay, so 
that would be, I'm just going to duplicate this one so I don't have to type too, too much. So. Ah, I wanted to keep that exponent there. E raised to the KT power. So I have this K there. The T will work for both of them, but the K will work only for the second one. R for the first one, K for the second one. So we have our two formulas here, the two, the two main ones. I'll get the compound interest stuff in there too in a few minutes, but the, this is, these are really the ones I wanted to focus on for the time being. All right. So if we look at the R value here, you see the R value dictates the, the slope of the exponential curve. Right. And depending on whether that R value is positive or negative, you would have growth or decay, right? And if the R value happens to be zero, it's not, ex it's not exponential at all. It's just a horizontal line. But that horizontal line is the transition between a negative slope and a positive slope, all right? Now, if you look at the, the continuous one, you can see that it, it pretty much does the same thing, all right? There are many instances in which one formula is equivalent to the other, all right? It all depends on what the coefficients are. So for example, if I put this at 0.6, if it'll stay at 0.6, I'm just gonna type it in. It looks like it's approximately the same, right? In instances where the R value for the exponential growth is 0.8, N is equal to the one. The K value for continuous exponential growth is 0.6. You're looking at two graphs that are fairly similar to one another. Yeah, they're, they're a little bit deviant from one another uh, further down the line, but not, not substantially so, All right? So what we get from this is the idea that you're looking at two formulas that can be used interchangeably depending on what you refer to as the k value for a continuous growth and if you what you refer to as the r value for exponential growth right so in a lot of ways you could use one in place of the other but at a minimum at least you have a desmos that'll do some computations for you and give you a graph all right so let me just get in the um Compound interest, so a note, compound interest. That's capital A, usually a function of time. So A of T is equal to capital P for some reason, times one plus R over N raised to the NT power. So a couple of new sliders here, and it's up to you if you wanna group all your sliders together. You know, like I said, I'll put this on Blackboard so you have access to it, but this will give you the graph of your compound interest formula. And then if you want continuous compound interest, that's A equals, so A of T, function of time, is equal to capital P, lowercase e raised to the rt power. All right, so all these formulas are really there for you. But like I said, if you want, you can just 
you know, maneuver all the sliders so that they're one area and you have all the formulas in one area, but that's up to you. I personally like to have any variable that's unique to a formula, uh, any uh, coefficient that's unique to a formula group with that, but that, that's, that's personal preference, right? So exponential formulas. And I'll get this up on Blackboard for you. All right, but you can see here, like for example, just going back, I'll take you back to that guppy problem. If you are, if you know that you're dealing with exponential function, so exponential growth, I would turn off everything that's not exponential growth. So all this other stuff, I don't care about the green one. I would know that my n sub zero would be equal to four. And my R value was equal to a two, so I'd slide my slider over to that. And now I have the appropriate graph. If I want to evaluate my function, I would just type in N of T is e and it would give me the 512, just like we did here. Right? But I could also um, you know, just crunch it out, create, go to the table of values, and a bunch of other ways to do it. But you know, it's kind of ask and answer at this point. You could also trace along the graph if you want to go a little little crazy with it, but you know, I don't know if you want to go down that. But just something for you. Uh, I'm going to put stars on the remaining problems. And we'll start off class next time going over those. Um, there's really only two more topics in this unit. One is something called the unit circle. And the other is creating uh, trigonometric graphs. Uh, with the trigonometric graphs, they, they have their own set of word problems. But those word problems are much easier because it's, um, it, it, there isn't much you can do with it at this point. It's really just. Here's a, an equation. Now tell me some aspects of it, some attributes. All right, but that that's the next couple of classes, and then we'll be kind of looking uh, looking at the unit test. All right, so we're in the home stretch for this unit. Uh, that'll get us up to, in case you're wondering, page 44. I don't know why this packet goes. Well, actually, no, sorry. There's some inverse trig stuff in here. I don't know why it's here. It shouldn't be. It's, I don't even think it's in this course, honestly. Um, yeah, so it's the rest of the packet, but page 44 shouldn't be there. I'm sorry, page 45 shouldn't be there. It's so weird. All right, anyway, different conversation for a different day. All right, so that's where we're going to leave it. If you have any questions, stick around. Otherwise, enjoy the uh, remainder of the evening, and I will see you next week. If you came in late, check with me before you go. See you.